Hey everybody, it's Jake and Holden from the Wizard and the Bruiser podcast. And we are coming to you live in the Midwest in January with Page 7. And that's going to be happening on the 9th of January in Chicago at Lincoln Hall. Then you have the 10th of January in Pontiac, Michigan happening at the Crowfoot. And last but very not least, the Milwaukee show is happening on January 11th. And that's going down at the back room at Collectivo. Please join us. Two great podcasts. One unforgettable evening. And we are going to be hanging out after the show. I want to see your pretty faces. I want to hang. I want to have a blast. And also you can get tickets at lastpodcastnetwork.com forward slash P7 live. That's lastpodcastnetwork.com forward slash P7 live. Be there. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast on the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. What was that? Ah, Christmas Eve. I one day of work. <laughs> 4315 Charlotte Street. I wonder what the good little Bobby wants this year for Christmas. Hmm. <laughs> oh, Bobby, you're awake. Yes, yeah, Santa, I don't go to sleep. Oh, Bobby. <laughs> Appears to be. I was supposed to. I imagined I was going to give you a gift, but it appears that you're on my naughty list for some. Oh, my lord, Bobby, you're not wearing any clothes. What? Oh, hit some nail with a pipe. Oh! Okay, time for my Christmas gift. Wait a second. You don't have a butthole. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh, Santa doesn't have a butthole. Oh, my God. Welcome to the last podcast on the left, everyone. I am Ben, staring at the beautiful face of Marcus. Hi, Ben. Hello, Marcus. And, of course, we have Henry Zabrowski over there in sunny in Los Angeles. Yeah, man. Honestly, it's very cold. It was 57 degrees this morning. Oh, <laughs> how'd you even deal with it? How'd you even deal with it? Well, we thought that this was, I mean, what a good topic for the holidays. Sure. Right, boys? I feel like we finally really nailed it, because what have we done in the past? We did, you know, Christmas murders. We did a revelation on Jesus many years ago, which is highly inappropriate. I don't know if you should even go back and listen to that episode. Well, I thought that was a fairly good episode, Revelations. Oh, no, he's talking about the Jesus episode that we did a few years ago. I don't even remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was like seven years ago. Okay. Um, there's a lot of hot takes in that. Okay. Um, but this episode, I think, is particularly perfect for Christmas because it really shows everybody else how we feel about the holiday. Well, Henry, honestly, you have been getting into the Christmas spirit. I, I a little bit. It's really bizarre. Hey, Marcus, have you noticed that? I have not. Henry on Side Stories was raving about Santa Claus. He said he <laughs> wants all the children forever and ever to believe in Santa Claus. And he was upset when I challenged the notion that Santa Claus was real or not. Uh -huh. And I said, it's not real. He's not real. St. Nicholas, perhaps, was real. Right. Um, but I really, you've changed. I uh, do love the psychic entity of Santa Claus. You've changed. His heart <laughs> has grown. It oh, has. It really has. Okay, everyone. Today's subject, this guy, he, I mean, he's, you know what he looks like? He looks like, you know the Chris Farley sketch where he has the heart attack and he vomits up the steak? Da Bears? Sure. He looks like yeah. someone who roots for Da Bears. <laughs> Don't worry, doctor said I have a baker's dozen. <laughs> uh, and his name is Bob Berdella. Mm-hmm. Bob Berdella, a.k.a. the Kansas City Butcher, was an art school dropout serial killer who captured, tortured, and murdered at least six young men in Kansas City, Missouri between 1984 and 1987. What is it with art school dropouts? Why are they all so dangerous? We got Hitler, we got Berdella. Is it just the failure to paint that makes them go crazy? We've talked about how actors and artists are incredibly dangerous people and people need to be more afraid of them. They can <laughs> appear to be anything that they want to be. If you put a different hat on them, different accent, all of a sudden is he from Jolly Old London? Oh, is he from South Africa? Is that man from South Africa? You know, they, you don't know what an actor is going to be. That's true. <laughs> Much like John Wayne Gacy, Bob Berdella chose his victims from the fringes of society. Some were men dabbling in sex work to feed drug addictions, while others were just in and out of trouble with the law. But all were young, thin, white, and fair-haired. Hmm. 
And just like Gacy, Bob Berdella had a reputation amongst the young male hustlers of Kansas City as a man who enjoyed injecting men with drugs and torturing them before letting them go. If you listen to any true crime documentary or read any article about Bob Berdella, they always call him hustlers. And it's not in the new self-actualized hustlers let's embrace the idea of hustling this is back when it was still very shameful to be a hustler interesting indeed so they're not like the cast from entourage they're not out there (laughs) hustling in hollywood trying to make it in the business Kissel, they're closer to the cast of Entourage than the cast of Entourage would like them to consider themselves. <laughs> okay. But but the one thing about Bob Berdiello, which I love, I, it's taken us a long time to get to him. He has been, people have been asking us about Bob Berdiello since the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. And I remember when we first started with like, I think as you first start getting into serial killers, I think when I was somewhere at like 12, 13 years old and you kind of see his name as you go through your various, if I had the little yellow mass market A to Z encyclopedia of serial killers and you go through Dahmer, you go through Gacy, you go through Son of Sam, these very iconic figures, but then you immediately bump up against the second layer. Of serial killers that you start to realize that in my mind didn't fully realize until I got into on the internet and especially with the advent of things like somethingrotten.com and 4chan the very beginning of it and I saw Bob Burdella again and again and again and I didn't realize that there's a whole second tier it's when I was I was younger that is this oh th- this is kind of like the uh indie hipster serial killer layer that I'm first delving into and Bob Burdella is kind of a big fucking doorway into that world. Well, these are the guys that Mm. are too weird to be really in the mainstream sphere of knowledge. You know, it's guys Mm -hmm. like Bob Berdella, Pee Wee Gaskins, Haddon Clark, Joseph Callinger. Like, these stories are just too fucking strange and most of the time just too gross to really cover. And they're they're the ones that make people feel, like, too weird to really enjoy. All right, well, let's cover it then. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. What a wonderful little uh, preamble for the disgusting tale to come. But for the most part, Berdella is somewhat unique in serial killer lore for the fact that all of his murder victims were at the very least acquaintances, if not out-and-out associates, Hmm. unlike Gacy, who knew only a few of his victims prior to their murders. Also unlike Gacy, Bob Berdella was no closeted blue-collar killer who would quickly murder his victims and hide the bodies. Instead, Bob Berdella was an out-and-proud local character who ran a curiosity shop out of the local flea market. And Bob Berdella took his time torturing each and every victim from anywhere from a single night to six weeks. Oh, damn. You just have to have a sick to it attitude, and you got to be fun about it. You got to be a good host. <laughs> I but the guess. thing about Bob Berdella is that also, as you read about him, you kind of expect him to be closer to a big, crazy animal like Carl Panzram or somebody that's kind of like a, a character. Like you, I for me, I was expecting the fucking the most evil version of the Riddler ever. <laughs> right. When you see his interviews or like hear him talk, but he's actually just so quiet. And he's just so, what was the word we realized? Fussy. He's fussy. He's fussy. (laughs) And isn't that the biggest crime of all? (laughs) But his whole, but he was super out. He used to hand people pictures of of men lifting barbells. And he's like, take a look at this slack of sausage right here. Isn't he kind of a fun boy? I wish he was over here (laughs) slopping on my jelly. And they're like, oh, Bob, you're being funny. You're being, you're being it today. And he's like, yeah, I'm feeling it. Tug on my tail. See what kind of tiger I turn into. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. You can only imagine what would happen. Well, we know all of these details about Bob Berdella because Bob Berdella took copious notes for every single one of his six murder victims, as well as Polaroid pictures of each stage of torture in addition to post-mortem photos. Hmm. Now, of course, since Bob Berdella ran a curiosity shop that had all manner of skulls, creepy art, and occult objects, the media tried rolling the Bob Berdella murders into the satanic panic of the late 80s, early 90s. Hmm. And no media figure made more hay out of Bob Berdella than Geraldo Rivera, who featured Bob as a part of his 1988 expose, 
Devil Worship, Exposing Satan's Underground. Well, yes. if you don't expose sta- sta- Satan's Underground, he's never going to know he's got a booby butt. <laughs> that is just wonderful. <laughs> That's really fun. But you also got to understand, if you send an inspector down to the underground, you better be careful what kind of violations you find in that underground because th- that's where you're going to kick up a lot of red tape inside if you want to buy Satan's house in order to refurbish it to your own wants and needs. Now, that is more of an inside reference that Henry is trying to buy a house and he's going through some <laughs> troubles. So that's I'm fun just saying, how you got it in here. You shoehorned it. If you want to expose Satan's underground, you got to understand you may uh, there might be some devilish violations in there. Yeah. You might have to go to the most dreaded city uh, department of permits. Oh. Oh. Get a permit for an outdoor living situation. Honestly, that's the scary Scariest place in the world. Uh, but uh, when it comes to Geraldo and Berdella, who do you think got the better mustache? Ooh. Who are you giving the mustache? Because Berdella has it. a mustache that can... I can see the cookie crumbles in the mustache. <laughs> Geraldo, I think it's too greasy, and it, and it sort of goes down the face. I think it doesn't... I don't think it holds a crumble, and I feel like that is crucial to a good mustache. How much crumble can you hold? I think that it depends on a style of mustache. Geraldo Rivera's mustache is obviously a businessman's mustache. Yep. It is one for it is for outward people. It's for other people. Bob Berdella's mustache is for himself. <laughs> it collects cum so that he can get at it later. <laughs> <laughs> well, Geraldo Rivera's r- mustache is a ripoff. It's a Yosemite Sam mustache. Oh, That's all it is. Okay. But Bob Berdella's mustache is quite original, if I might say so myself. So Berdella wins the mustache wars. I'm going to put Berdella over Geraldo any fucking day. Yep. I mean, he murdered six men. Geraldo just <laughs> gave our location you for just U.S. For military him. troops. You just fought for him. <laughs> but when Berdella was asked point blank if his crime had a satanic angle or if there was any truth to the rumor that he performed an exorcism on a child, Berdella wryly said, quote, No, I've never exercised anybody. I don't even like aerobics. Come on, guys. <laughs> look Hell at yeah. The, look at <laughs> that. Up top. Don't Up even top. like aerobics. Wow. I don't even like aerobics. <laughs> this guy <laughs> is, he is something. I'm a funny guy. I'm a funny guy. You're kind of tall for me. Do you mind if I cut off your feet? <laughs> uh, you know what it is, too. The thing about Bob is that he's not Bob was a curiosity collector and salesman, so they want to say Satanist, but it's more like if the founder of the guy that runs the hyena gallery in Burbank, who sells <laughs> all of this shit that you would see in Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, if he started killing people, it's kind of almost putting a hat on a hat. It's kind of too on the nose. Right. I agree. I agree. See, from what Bob Berdella himself proclaimed from prison, he was not a monster, hmm. but was rather, quote, a neighbor who had done some monstrous things. After all, it's not like he killed every day. To him, serial killing was an occasional dalliance. Okay. You're lucky it's only a hobby. If I could flip <laughs> it, if there was a Patreon that I could have joined in order to kill Ooh. as many boys as possible, e- you know, let's see what the perks are and see what I could set up with the tears. I actually need some help with that. I need, like, an assistant. Maybe if I get a young blonde <laughs> boy or something. But I just keep running out of them. Furthermore, in his estimation, it wasn't even his fault that he'd killed and tortured all those men. It was actually the fault of the Kansas City PD. Why? Because if police had done a better job, Bob wouldn't have been able to kill so many people. Ah! If you watch this interview with him, he did one interview because he died very quickly after he got into prison. We'll cover all that in the second episode. But he definitely says, he's like, they just don't understand how dangerous Kansas City is. There's guys like me everywhere. They <laughs> they just should have done a more due diligence. They should have been out there because it's like, you know, they're out there trapped in there with people like me. <laughs> all right. So he's blaming the cops. But could they have done a better job? Yes. OK. Absolutely. I mean, he's, he definitely it's definitely his fault. But we'll see again it's and again fault. that the cops it's safely. It's safely his fault. Safely his fault. The cops could have done a better job without okay. a doubt. All right. And it is possible, but unlikely, that Bob killed more than six. Between 1984 and 1988, Bob's killing years, 47 men went missing from Kansas City's main gay sex work spot, 10th and McGee. And none of those dudes have ever been accounted for. What is in the barbecue? That's what we have to start asking <laughs> oh, ourselves. Oh, no. Kansas City is oh, great no. barbecue. Both of you consumed way no. too much of it. It's the best barbecue in the world. 
It's human meat. Mm. <laughs> I tell you what, whatever the secret is, it's hard. if I don't know, if I'm ignorant, see no evil, hear no evil, taste no evil, what am I doing here? Right? Yeah. I, let's, I, I've committed no crime. Let's just say what I said is true. And you're in Kansas City and you see the barbecue and you know it's a human. What are you doing? I would never capital K know that it's a human. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, really, like, Bob Berdella was just a nerdy, pathetic, sexual sadist with a big old belly. I- I'd call him, like, an art school John Wayne Gacy. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I mean, more or less just a local joke, both before and after his capture. A local joke, A huh? local joke. Oh, well, man. Well, jokes don't kill six people. Well, we'll get into how, uh, I guess, funny Kansas City got. <laughs> After Bob Berdella was uh, captured on episode two, they got real funny. They got funny. He oh, experienced yeah. a Kansas City comedy boom <laughs> when he was committing his crimes, and this is true. We'll get into all that. <laughs> but before we get too deep into the story of Bob Berdella, let's acknowledge our sources for today. The first is Rites of Burial by Tom Jackman and Troy Cole. This book, highly recommended, legitimate true crime writing. The other, however, is a fantastic little documentary called Bizarre Bizarre, Ooh. starring crime author James Elroy and distributed by Troma. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's honestly, this. what a good excuse to watch a documentary again. Uh-huh. Dogmeat and I both talked about how the last time I remembered watching Bizarre Bizarre, I didn't remember watching it because of how high I was. Same and here. it's definitely one of those. Yeah. This movie is possibly the most Tasteless, trashy, dong-hanging true crime documentary ever made. Hangs a lot of dong. No Mm. way. A trauma documentary (laughs) with a lot of dong. I don't believe it. It is without a doubt recommended if you want to see how trash is truly done. Trauma's like, the best of trash. I mean, it's a, it, it is a true crime documentary by way of John Waters. Great. It's good bad taste, as Love John it. Waters used to say. It's a nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Features uh, James Elroy's band, The Devil Dogs. Man, oh. they have got some good songs. I think they wrote an entire album about Bob Berdella. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about Bob Berdella that is captured in many songs. Yeah. And then there's also another film called Berdella that was filmed in 2009, which I saw scenes from and don't watch it because right. it's not good. It's unfortunately not good. There's a lot of animation in there, but mostly it's just a man with a pasted on mustache going, you want another hit? <laughs> to a guy going, whoa, what? And then he gives another hit and then it's slow motion of him pulling pants over butts, slowly licking the small of the back, putting the needles in, which is cool. Again, I mean, again, yeah. if this makes you horny, fucking rock it out. But it's, you know, it is for certain audiences. Yeah, That that is a strange birthday cake, my friend. (laughs) So, without further ado, let's get into the life of Bob Berdella. Please! (laughs) Bob Berdella was born in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio on January 31st, 1949, is the eldest of two boys born to Robert Berdella Sr., and Mary Berdella. I was really hoping you were going to mispronounce Cuyahoga Falls uh-huh. because I know that it's called Cuyahoga, and I was going to be like, uh, "No, it's not Cahogia or whatever." You were going to say it's Cuyahoga Falls. I'm from the Midwest. I know that, but but you pronounced it right, so I still had to make it up because you didn't pronounce it right, so that I could correct you. But you actually said it right. Now Bob is a bit of an anomaly when it comes to serial killers in more ways than one. Unlike John Wayne Gacy, his closest analog, Bob Berdella did not come from an overly abusive home. Hmm. While his father did occasionally fly into violent rages, Bob's childhood was not marked by a sustained campaign of abuse, nor was he said to be an abnormal child when it came to animal when it came to animal mutilation or violent behavior, at least as far as we know. Okay. Do you think it's not normal for a father to sometimes occasionally fly into semi-violent rages? It seems that's what fathers do. I mean, it depends. Sometimes. It's, it's tax not, season. It, it shouldn't be done. It definitely shouldn't be a part of a household growing up. Well, it shouldn't be. A violent rage doesn't necessarily mean you actually get violent. A yeah. violent rage is just like, you just like, ah! God, <laughs> 
<laughs> my father was going through a period of time when he was setting up an outside television show. For my, every once in a while, my mom would let my dad have a Super Bowl party because she never liked it because she hated all of his friends <laughs> because they were all just big, drunk, awful monster cops. And so well, I remember the one time where he was just like, everybody, we're doing it. There's an outside party. It is an inside party. And he went outside and he was on this campaign of not cursing in front of the kids because my mom had yelled at him about it. And so he was out there going, son of a... Ma, you got you got it god damn like with this little television that he was trying to set up outside and i watched him take this little television and just throw it into the yard and just like oh god wow like doing these crazy noises that took years off of his life that and everyone sense. was mad and then my mom went and stayed in a hotel huh. well she, she had a nice night uh those little tvs were horrible and mostly Young Bob just sounded like a nerdy little pain in the ass. Hmm. His teachers said he was an intelligent, if frustrating, student. And from a young age, Bob had to wear thick prescription glasses to correct his severe nearsightedness. As such, Bob was a loner. And neighbors who grew up around the Berdellas in Ohio speculated that his best friend was probably his mother. Oh, isn't that oh, that's cute. Good. Oh, damn. <laughs> his father, on the other hand, didn't really care for Bob. Why not? Because um, Bob wasn't in sports. Uh, unlike his younger brother, Danny. Now, Danny, that's a boy that's into sports. But, Father, isn't there a sport to watercolor? <laughs> Listen, Father, I was thinking about just the idea of just the idea of capturing a pelican, not physically, because I, their beaks are just so snappy and so big, but the idea of capturing it with a photograph or capturing it with some sort of tempera paint, that would be, <laughs> Dad, where... Oh, well, he's just at the bar already. He's been gone for days. <laughs> You ain't my son. <laughs> ain't my son. No, I remember my father wasn't a big sportsman, but, you know, he kind of expected something out of a more, you know, a, a masculine child. He didn't understand that a child could be very intense and have a lot of intense emotions and love Phantom of the Opera. And it's a little difficult. Sometimes you got to give your child to grow and become fully straight in his way. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You must. Yeah, it must have been interesting for your father as soon as he found out his son couldn't breastfeed because he was too weak. No, no, you didn't understand that I was saving to do it for pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord! Get off of my wife! You're my son. <laughs> Instead of sports, Bob liked staying inside. He liked mm -hmm. reading books. He liked painting. He loved to expand his vast coin and stamp collection. Okay. Bob also spent a fair amount of time writing to various pen pals around the world, which is what first piqued his interest in foreign artifacts. All right. Also, kind of like a very, very, very urgent, maybe the original version, I want to say, the, of like talking to people on the internet. Because mm -hmm. when you're pen pals... You can be anybody that you want. Did you guys have that? We had a foreign pen pal program in elementary school. And yeah. I remember just lying to this kid in Somalia. Just saying <laughs> yeah. shit, just whatever. I, I think I might have said, yeah, I'm Henry McDonald. Yeah, I'm an heir to the McDonald fortune. We're milkshake rich. <laughs> but yeah, it we shows did that. But, I, but I'm, I guarantee you that our teachers never sent our letters. Yeah. Because I, I remember <laughs> writing the letters. Yeah. And I never, we never got anything back. Nope. I think it was just in the trash. Yeah. Yeah, I think were, Mrs. Hasty probably threw those fucking letters away now that I think about it. Yes. Why did I even write my personal yes. feelings down for this random person who I thought could be a friend? You were writing to the child soldiers of the Congo. They're not getting letters. <laughs> they like the thought of it, but Bob, you see now, right? He begins dissing himself. He can lie about whatever he wants, anybody he wants. And then the collections began Ooh. immediately. Mm -hmm. That will come into play later. Mm-hmm. And even though Bob was said to be a devout Catholic as a child, said he was overall a good boy. Uh, okay, first of all, that's this is the first sign of sociopath. That a child would be like, oh, I am a devout Catholic. You're eight <laughs> years old. You that was me. Be, that's insanity. So far, this is all me. Yeah. Oh, dangerous. Yep. Well, Berdella claims that everything changed when he saw the 1965 film adaptation of the serial killer's favorite <gasps> book, the Collector. Wow. I don't like when they do this, though. When, when they, they blame art, when of they course. blame movies. Of course. Because no. it, it just reflects poorly on everything. Yeah. I mean, longtime listeners of the show will remember The Collector from our Leonard Lake and Charles Eng series. And Bob Berdella shares more than a few traits with the long-deceased Leonard Lake. <sighs> Very much so. 
But to give you the cliff notes on The Collector, though, the movie and the book are about a lonely young man named Fred Clegg who captures a woman he works with named Miranda and keeps her in the basement until she gets sick and dies. Hmm. Every serial killer's dream. The idea that they will love you. I'll make them love you. Hmm. I'll make them love me by putting them in a prison. But my question is, is that how does the author of The Collector feel about this shit? Do they even know? Like, do you think about, like, because I don't think J.D. Salinger ever talked about his connection, what, uh, or truly did a little bit. I think that's why he became a recluse. Right. When he s- said the, why his book. Uh, Catcher in the Rye for Why for Catcher John in Lennon. the Rye. Yeah. Like, why was that a, a an inspiration to killers? I think that J.D. Salinger did what a lot of normal people would do. When he's like, I wrote this great book. You all took it wrong. You, you're you not mature enough as a society for my art. I'm going to stare at a fireplace for the next 30 years. <laughs> well, he definitely was like that. He became very cruel. Yes. J.D. Salinger, like, it definitely soured him on the human experience. Yeah. The, a bunch of people taking his work and flipping it. But I, this the collector guy, I wonder if he had p- women in his basement. He seems like, no, he's just a writer. He just wrote a bunch of different novels like The French Lieutenant's Woman, the mm. Magus, the Ebony Tower, Mantisa. Oh. The uh, French Lieutenant's Woman is the most <laughs> awkward book title ever. I think that's technically, is that an adaptation of the, was it Captain Mangaleri's Madeline? With Captain Nick Cage? Mandela, Captain, <laughs> Ma- Captain Mandalay's Mandalay? Captain Moretti's? Captain Moretti's? Captain, Ma- Captain I think it's <laughs> Dr. Captain- Mangalo's guitar. <laughs> I think it's Captain Corelli's mandolin. Yes, there it is. <laughs> Why do I care about Captain Corelli's mandolin? <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm looking at a picture of John Fowles right now, the author of The Collector. And you know, he looks like the guy from the video, like, I'm trying to enjoy a succulent Chinese meal. You are resting me, and I was enjoying a succulent Chinese meal. <laughs> Take your hands off of me, police officers. <laughs> Well, Berdella claims that when he saw the adaptation of The Collector in 1965, something switched on deep inside, and he was thereafter forever changed, which is just a big pile of serial killer horseshit. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. That wasn't the reason why you did it. The reason why you did it was because you love to hug in a way that was criminal. Yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> What actually had an effect on Berdella was the death of his father. Mm. On Christmas Day, 1965, Robert Berdella Sr. had a heart attack and died two days later at the tender young age of 39. Damn, okay. You're just sitting what a there gift. watching your father in a Santa hat, just struggling as you die, and you're just a young Bob Berdella eating hot dogs, just going... <laughs> Is there something wrong, Daddy? You're sick. And he's just like, stop eating hot dogs at night, Bobby. How many times I got to tell you you look like the Michelin tire, man? Daddy? Daddy? (laughs) Well, more Christmas gifts for him. His dad's little TV that the mom bought. Pretty soon after, Mary Berdella remarried, and within just a few months, Bob went from dealing with the death of his father to dealing with the new dad stepdad Hmm. that he absolutely hated. But the event from Bob's teenage years that probably had an even more pronounced effect on Bob was when he was raped by a co-worker while he was working as a line cook at a local restaurant. Damn. Very similar to Carl Panzerim. Mm -hmm. The idea that that's what he said was the first thing that taught him that violence and subjugation of others was the way to equalize your standing in the world. Mm -hmm. But Panzerim did seem to have it a bit rougher. Much rougher. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Now, Bob tended to gloss over this event when he later spoke with psychiatrists, maintaining that it was, quote-unquote, society's fault that Mm. he became a serial killer. But there's no doubt that this had a horrifically negative effect on Bob's psyche. Right. But what was it about the mid-60s and stuff like the way my mom talks about being molested by priests? It was like a thing. It was like a a coupon you got in the mail the way she describes how often it was and how much yeah. this shit happened I, I know that things have changed quite a bit and that's what that's it's very good that the optics have changed but the way all these people have been like yeah yeah it happened to me he pushed me down inside the fry machine and he made love to me but it's like you have to be like you're like whoa 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 that's like a massive thing and it's kind of a thing that you did to six grown men in your house you don't think it has anything to do with your crimes it's yeah. like no no it's tv <laughs> TV did it. 
supplies from your grave. Hey guys, just a little reminder. Time is running out on Simply Safe's huge holiday offer. It's their biggest sale of the year. If you're looking to fully protect your home with award-winning 24/7 home security, now is the time to do it. Burglaries spike during the holiday season. Sometimes a man just broke up from an insane asylum. He killed a mall Santa and he's wearing a Santa costume and he's watching your children through the blinds. With families traveling and leaving empty homes and expensive gifts behind, Simply Safe's holiday sale couldn't come at a better time. Simply Safe has everything you need to protect your home and your family. An army of sensors and cameras that guards every window, door, and room in your home. And if there's a break-in, they can give real-time video confirmation to police as it happens. So police respond to it up to 3.5 times faster. No surprise, Simply Safe has won CNET and PC Magazine's Editor's Choice Awards. Simply Safe made a holiday offer with our listeners in mind, but it ends December 31st. They rarely do deals this big, so now's your chance. Visit simplysafe.com/left to find out just how much you'll save. And remember, this sale ends December 31st. First, go today. SimplySafe.com slash L E F T. from your grave. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, no matter how comfortable you are around pots and pans. Now Lee's learning to cook with HelloFresh. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get wow-worthy dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes. And if you're like me and find yourself cooking the same couple of standbys night after night, you know my foie gras milkshakes. And all I do is just, I, sometimes it's fun to just pour half a bottle of bourbon into a thing of buttercream and just house it and then fall asleep outside. HelloFresh can break you out of your recipe hut. HelloFresh is 20 plus seasonal chef curated recipes each week and they have more five star recipes than any other meal kit. So you're sure to get something delicious. But most importantly, HelloFresh is super flexible and fits your lifestyle. Easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need. I know we get the vegetarian HelloFresh boxes, and they are really great. It's so good when you've been working all day. You come home at night, you can put together a quick meal. We have those grain bowls. We love those grain bowls. And the flatbreads are very good. Oh, it's fun to do. You share it with the family. Get nine free meals with HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash LastPod9 and using code LastPod9. One more time, that's nine free meals with HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash L-A-S-T-P-O-D-9 and use code Last pod nine. Fly from your grave. Well, two years later, Bob graduated from Cuyahoga Falls High School, moved to Kansas City, and enrolled at the Kansas City Art Institute. Woo! Where he quickly became annoyed with the drug addled hippie lifestyle <laughs> that pervaded college campuses in the late 60s. So he's not even a cool nerd. No. He's not even someone who doesn't play sports because they're too busy getting uh, high behind the, the dumpster. No. He had to be an antisocial personality no matter what it was, even mm. when it was cool to be antisocial. But even though Bob didn't do drugs, he found he was a pretty savvy drug dealer. So he started selling weed, pills, and amphetamines to his fellow students. And he even started growing out his hair and wearing gaudy clothes. Okay. And it was said that Bob loved being the center of attention. And according to rites of burial, he would, quote, dance outlandishly, but not necessarily well. And honestly, that must have been incredible to find clothes this size in that in that time period because it's incredibly hard to find 70s vintage that fits a belly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, even though this sounds like Bob was coming out of a shell, the problem was that no one liked Bob because Bob was a sarcastic, pretentious, overbearing art school dickhead. Ah. In one of his many dubious performance pieces... He had an audience of students and teachers stand on chairs and put bags over their heads. And with their faces covered, he'd walk up to each one and scream obscenities. You bitch! Shit ass! Shit ass! Fuck tart! Fuck farts! (laughs) Fuck farts and ass! Ass and shit! Shit! Don't fuck! 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 Shit! <laughs> that might be my favorite art exhibit of all time. You I don't like that. This is you sat down in a class. You, the least popular kid in class, who has been probably screaming about how you know Da Vinci sucks. You know what I mean? It's like those kind of guys <laughs> yeah. where he hates every single thing that's classic, and he, he hates all the stuff. So he's like, so today we're gonna do a big boy art exercise. I hope you guys are ready for it. I hope your minds are open enough for it. And everyone's gonna like, okay, Bob. Stand up on your seats. We're all going to act as ghosts in the trees. And he puts a bag over everybody's head. And you have to sit there because it's fucking class. It's but art. He's using this as a purpose. He's doing this on purpose. 
to scream obscenities in people's faces. And he is manipulating the the sacred agreement between a performance artist and its audience of, I will allow you to squirt blood on me, but I must believe on some way this means something. Like, I <laughs> I, I have to. You have to somehow convince me that this means something. Oh, it and means so you something. Just, you have hepatitis C now. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Exciting? I know. But I could just see the teacher just being like, you got a C, Bob. <laughs> what do you mean? I broke ground today. You did nothing, Bob. You <laughs> just said shit. You said fuck shit like five times. That was a big deal. We're coming out of the 50s. It's very conservative time. You got to get it out. Well, after that, Bob got cruel. His next project was a small maze, and anyone who entered the maze was handed a baby chicken. Uh Uh-oh. Waiting for them at the end of the maze was a short film on a loop of a different baby chicken who would be shown pecking at food before someone off screen blew it away with a shotgun. Whoa. And sometimes, but not always, the people watching would involuntarily squeeze the baby chicken they were holding, hurting it, if not accidentally killing it. That's not on Bob. That is yes, on the is. person. No, it is. If, uh, if no, I it's... see some, What? You think that's a bad take? I think that's a horrible fucking take. Why would you squeeze <laughs> the chicken to death if you see a chicken it's dying in front of you? Because they're scared because they're suddenly seeing a, a chicken being killed on screen and it's an extremely loud shotgun blast. And they don't know what the fuck to do with a baby chicken. You it's a it horrible down. take. I honestly, I don't think I would squeeze the chicken to death. I, it's different because you're used to hold things gentle because you got big hands and you have, you've been learning to how you have to hell, hand a delicate Bud Light can all the time <laughs> without crushing it just in the pressure of the gravity of yeah. your knuckles. Yeah, you are you are hyper aware of accidentally crushing something with your huge hands. <laughs> <It's> just, okay, <laughs> the, all the right. The rest of me don't think about it that much. Okay, <laughs> you have the same size hands as I do, Marcus. If I had a duckling in my hands for more than 15 minutes, I might accidentally kill it in any time just sitting here just because my blood pressure <laughs> okay all right but the thing was that bob Berdella was sitting there at the exit to the maze watching people <laughs> waiting for them to accidentally squeeze the thing I see. Like, he loved it, loved every fucking minute of it <laughs> i love seeing you do it i love seeing you do it you didn't want to do it did you <laughs> strange art now, not a single person was impressed with what Bob was doing, but Bob maintained that the problem was everyone else, and that no one got his art because it was, quote, too challenging. Oh. So remember what you sound like when you say that about your art <laughs> as a listener. Remember that. Remember who else said that. <laughs> well, in his last piece, he brought a living duck to campus, chopped off the head in a courtyard, mm. And danced around the corpse chanting nonsense. Where's he getting oh, all the right. poultry? You can buy Paul. Po- oh, man. Yeah, I can get you a duck as soon as you want. Well, honestly, I want one in 10 minutes. <laughs> I can't. I'm recording a show right now. Okay, after the show. <laughs> I will Postmates a duck to you. We don't even advertise for Postmates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though Bob did eat the duck that night, the administration was not necessarily dazzled by Bob's daring exhibitions. When I was in school, art school, very, I went to an art school, kind of, that had a big art program. There was someone who crucified a squirrel, mm-hmm. and he wasn't allowed into the uh, art exhibit because it was a health violation. Yeah. But he's not a serial killer. You know, he's a kindergarten teacher. Uh, well, I mean, that's fine. It is a health violation. It is, but I'm just saying, a, art students are weird. It's a fine line. Again, it just, it works or it doesn't work. You really have to do a lot of work to make a performance art piece remotely legitimate. <laughs> I do appreciate performance art, but I've seen some that it was just a guy going. I remember that one time we did a comedy show with a performance artist who walked on stage. Again, I don't know what it stood for. He was completely nude. He was in roller skates. It was on July 4th, which so I <laughs> do think that this is a part of it. He pulled a rolled up American flag out of his asshole. I remember that. He had, which he had, was there for... Hours. Because we all sat there for hours. The show was late. I remember we were all there. No one was in the audience. And he was expecting to blow minds. Like he pulled it on. It was all covered in shit. And it was just like, and it was just murder fest. Just like watching, just going, God, man, we rehearsed whole sketches. Like we learned a bunch of lines for this. You did it the hard way. He did it the right way. So, in 1969, Bob dropped out of art school, still convinced that he was a misunderstood genius. Mm. 
and it was around this time that Bob Berdella also put down a $100 down payment on the house at 4315 Charlotte Street, which would eventually be the location where Bob would kill six young men. Did you say $100? Nah, it's 1969 yep. <laughs> in Kansas City. <laughs> what has happened to this country where you can put a down payment on a house for $100? It's a problem. It's a problem. It's a real big problem. Oh. It's a real problem. But this is one of those examples of a house and a killer being kind of symbiotic. Like they're, they really are important to each other. Like Ed Gein, like John Wayne Gacy, uh, Jerry Brudos, where there's something about, I'm, I'm not blaming the house, but there's something about this, this combination of the two where he found his lair. And then once he decided to make this his base of operations and like his playground, it became this like this inner world. Like literally he would compartmentalize his mind physically. Like he would create an area or the attic of this house became a place that people did not go to. And if you did go to it, sometimes you didn't get out of it. Damn. So, to support himself, Bob Berdella worked full-time in the restaurant business and eventually became a manager or a chef at all sorts of classy restaurants in Kansas City. This is the first artistic thing he's ever actually done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And another chef. Another chef. What yeah. is it with the chefs? I, we've gone this entire uh, this entire show without talking about chefs, and then suddenly we got two in a row. Damn. But these changes did not make Bob any less of a dickhead. He delighted in saying rude or gross shit to anyone around under the guise of being shucking, especially if someone new had showed up. But according to the people around him, the effect was not shock, but rather embarrassment. For Bob? Just that Bob was around. They were just, being around him just brought your quality of life down. Absolutely. Okay. But Bob was not necessarily concerned with other people. He was more interested in objects. While working as a chef, Bob began collecting artifacts and antiques from around the world, curios like shrunken heads, primitive art, and various occult items. And all throughout the 70s, that's pretty much all Bob did. But the only significant thing to happen to Bob in that decade, as far as we know, was that Bob came out of the closet and began living openly as a gay man in Kansas City. Oh, honestly, probably not easy to do in the 70s. It's a difficult position to take. And I it, I feel like, again, it speaks more to his, I want people, if I can't get a positive reaction out of you, I want to get a negative reaction out of you. So he did it for both reasons. Number one, just being like, I am who I am, which technically is good. It is good that he did that. Absolutely. But, but he also did it to be in your face. Like yeah. he did it purposefully to do it, which again, I, I think politically is very important. But nowadays, I mean, but in this, but with Bob Rodella, it is not, he wasn't thinking like that. I think that all of his shit was just him just trying to be as wild as possible. Right, right. And in 1981, Bob Berdella quit the restaurant business and became a full-time antiques dealer. Hmm. That was the year that he rented out a stall at the Westport Flea Market and opened up Bob's Bazaar Bizarre. It does roll off the tongue. (laughs) (laughs) And this is where the true legends about Bob Berdella begin to grow. Because he had all of this wicked looking shit. Half of it was fake, but it, it went with this sort of this vibe, right? Of being like, I have an inside tip. All I do is collect creepy. All I do is collect creepy things. And all I do are creepy things. It's fun. I just stay on brand. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Here, Bob became the unpleasant know-it-all gatekeeper, lord of the flea market, and scourge to collectors of the macabre everywhere. And Bob did have some cool shit for sale, but of particular interest to us are the human skulls that he sold. Where'd he get those from? Well, let's see. And it goes without saying that as soon as Bob's crimes came to light, anyone who bought a skull from Bob's Bizarre Bazaar came forward to make sure they weren't in possession of a murder victim. But predictably, all the skulls Bob sold at his shop, except one, were fake. And even the real one was far too old to be a victim of the Kansas City Butcher. Nice. I I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, it's sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Marcus, have you done the same with your piles of human skulls? Tested them to make sure none of them were fake? 
They, I, no, no, no. The opposite to see if they're murder victims. <laughs> Marcus. The yeah, Marcus, why is the first thing that you ask is... Also, do you have a pile of human skulls I, that I don't know about? I don't have a pile of human skulls. I have a human bo- jawbone that I was given in England, and that was tested to make sure that it was not a murder victim. It uh-huh. was a plague victim. Uh, and I do have some cufflinks that are made from human skulls, uh, but those have not been tested, and they're glass. Over anyway, like they're very, they're very uh, processed. Yeah, and, and yeah. the human skull doesn't look like a cufflink, so it's probably, <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But fake skulls, notwithstanding, the bazaar only occasionally turned enough profit to cover Bob's mortgage. To shore up costs, Bob started renting out rooms in his home. Although it sounded like an absolutely fucking awful place to live. Hmm. See, Bob was what you'd call a classic hoarder. Besides all the junk he bought or stole to sell at the bazaar, his house was also filled with stacks of newspapers, brown paper bags filled with magazines, garbage bags full of clothes, and just plain rotting garbage. And hoarding, much like uh, gaining a lot of weight in a very short period of time, was what they also what went down with Bob Berdella in this period of time, which is that he would constantly lament about how. That's why he said he needed to pay for sex workers because he didn't believe he could attract anybody because he gained a lot of weight. But a lot of what this is supposed to be, it's it's kind of like a comfort thing in a way, in a perverse way. It's right. creating shields all around you where if people don't want to come into my home, what that does is that it shows you, I'm telling you, fuck you first so that you can't tell me, fuck me afterwards so you can come into my home and it's totally disgusting you want to be in there but it's like we've been in these we've been in these stores yeah we've been in these houses marcus yeah we love these places technically (laughs) actually i would say if there was any serial killer who i might have become a victim of it might be bob berdella really yeah yeah go to his store and he's like you know what this stuff is cool but you should see what I have back at my house. Yeah, but Marcus, he would be rubbing all over your rump. He would be doing. I don't things. think he'd be rubbing all over you don't my think rump. He'd be rubbing rump. on the rump. He waited until you got to the house to rub all over your rump. Yeah, but then you would have to do. You would just lean in and be like, "But he's no, got I magazines." Would, I wouldn't lean in. You'll see later. I don't think I would have had the choice. Oh, dog meat. Fifteen years ago, though, you would have let him at least. No. Touch the top of your butt just to see Everyone the thing. Everyone experiments in college. <laughs> just a little. You would, you would make at least it sound like, like I was letting every man no. who said hello rub no. on my butthole. No. Oh and my it's God. I'm talking true. about guys with skulls for you to see. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> make out with a couple of guys in college and all of a sudden you're a Charlie Dick horse. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a Charlie Dick horse. Get out there. That's have a lot of that's fun. That's your prerogative. Good gracious. Well, Bob also had a bunch of big chow dogs and the whole house was littered with huge piles of dog shit because these were big dogs. Mm-hmm. You got to take them outside. Yeah. But that was the condition the cops found the place in when they busted him in 1988. Mm. Back in the early 80s, it probably wasn't quite that bad. Not as much Duke yet. Not as much Duke just yet. But then he was spending most of his time in his attic. And then he was kind of going back and forth for meals, but that's when he was in full-on amateur scientist mode. Well, he wasn't going back and forth to the Duke. He wasn't eating the poop, was he? (laughs) No, no. Who knows? Back then, Bob Berdella was renting out rooms to vulnerable young men who were in and out of trouble with the law, and Bob was doing it under the guise of performing a community service. For the most part, his neighbors applauded him for it, just like neighbors used to applaud John Wayne Gacy for giving jobs to underprivileged kids, even if those kids sometimes disappeared without a trace. Hmm. They uh, kids run away all the time. They always run away into shallow graves. How many times these kids I see a nice sixteen year old kid and he runs away, he puts a plastic bag over his head, he puts a bunch of clown makeup all over his dick, and he throws himself in the river. That's what these kids do. Uh John, you're dressed as Pogo. It's a ten year old's birthday party. Could you just not say this in front of all the I'm, I'm the entertainer. You're the entertainer. I'm the entertainer for the night. <laughs> See, Berdella's scam was to exchange rent for help around the house or the flea market. But usually that exchange also included sleeping with Bob Berdella on the regular. Mm. And if Berdella trusted someone enough, that guy would become a street liaison for Bob. Someone who would look for other vulnerable young men on the street and bring them back to Bob's house to quote-unquote 
party. He had his own Ghislaine Maxwell. <laughs> Isn't he that did. nice? <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. That's how a lot of these predators work. They find one person to find other victims. Also, I just want to put this out there. She's still free. <laughs> if you ever, if if you feel like arresting anyone, <laughs> She's feel free there. to go out there and get Ghislaine Maxwell, just whatever you want. Go get her. I've, I've been hanging out outside the in and out to see if she shows up <laughs> uh, to several locations. Uh, but the uh, it's right. It's so weird how like this shit is baked in to the scenario. I now fully believe that John Wayne Gacy had accomplices. You think so? I, I, I am pretty certain that he had at least had one accomplice that helps him because you, it happens again and again and again. Dean Coral, yeah. the same thing happened with him. With they they hire a, a group of vengeful orphans to go bring in more hustlers into yeah. the house. And it's it's baked in. It's so weird. You see the same exact parallels. He got in good with the neighborhood. Bob Rodella started a neighborhood watch. Yeah. Most neighborhood watch isn't just like, I'm going to watch you jerk off now. I'm going I'm to stare through your window and watch you masturbate. It's the neighborhood watch. I'm doing this as a public service. Well, once Bob got young men to his house, he would drug them, have sex with them, and send them on their way. One lodger named Philip Bukovic, who was lucky enough to get by with just living there, said that he saw up to 10 young men come in and out of Berdella's house in, in the short time he lived there in 1982. Honestly, oh. though, that neighbor sounds like a, a Snoopy Christian. No, he, was, he lived in the house. Oh, he lived in yes, the house. Yes, he, he was a lodger. He was a Cato. Do you he guys was know the- what lodger is? I don't really know that term, no. I mean, I understand what you're saying now, but no, I haven't really heard that term that often, no. The, the movie The Lodger... I think it was about Jack the Ripper. I don't know. (laughs) Bowie had an album called The Lodger. Wow. I love that album. Yeah, he had that song. He had that song where he like he just he, he coughed up a kernel of corn that was lodged in the back of his throat. Can you be imagine being fucking your roommate Phil? Yeah. You know, you're sitting on the living room surrounded by dog shit and Bob comes in and be like, This is I think his name is Trigger, <laughs> like a line of kids coming in. Meanwhile, you're just there, and they're like, "Hey, uh, Bob, could you not like eat my groceries when I put them in there? Because I I, I label them with a fill. If you would, those are my protein pancakes." <laughs> oh my goodness! Another young man named Jeff Marcus said his brother Jeb was once almost tied up by Berdella in Berdella's car. In other words, Bob Berdella was escalating and experimenting to see what he could get away with. Mm. As we said, Bob Berdella went against type when it came to choosing victims. And his first murder victim was someone he actually knew. His name was Jerry Howell, and he was the son of one of Bob's fellow flea marketeers. Hmm. Bob knew this guy's father for fucking years. And you brought up a good Damn. point, Marcus, when we were talking about how it's kind of the inverse of the normal serial killer move like mm-hmm. what happened with Israel keys where a lot of times they start with total strangers and they start turning towards the people they know because their berserker modes on the insides turning up the heat and they're trying to get at whoever is easy for mm-hmm. them they're also trying to like turn up the danger a little right. bit like let me see because it's if you kill someone you know and get away with it you get a little bit more of a jolt than you do with killing a stranger all right yeah and dog meat you know what? <laughs> what? 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 what was that? What was that? Now, Jerry certainly falls in line with the rest of Bob's victims when it comes to a criminal record. And Jerry was by no means a bad guy. You know, he'd really only gotten in trouble for fighting and stealing lawnmowers. But since Jerry needed legal help from time to time, Bob gained control. And eventually, the two started sleeping together. Now, as it goes time and again with serial killers, Bob's first murder was ostensibly an accident. Bob claims that the whole thing started when Jerry didn't want to have sex one night. So Bob drugged him to get his way. Yeah, like an accident. (laughs) Doesn't really seem like an accident to me, but okay. No, well, the drugging is not an accident, but the death, as we'll see, quite possibly could have been. Okay. According to Bob, Jerry's rejection had become a recurring issue, and Bob is starting to get frustrated. So he filled Jerry with Valium, animal tranquilizers, oh. and liquor before tying him down and raping him. But once Jerry was tied down, Bordella found that he loved being in absolute control. And in order to gain even more control, Bob started taking meticulous notes of every single thing he did to Jerry. 
And I believe Bob's notes that w- they become more and more ornate as they go. They are a way of him remembering every single thing that happened during these encounters so as a way to like a methadone for uh, afterwards okay. where he started jerking off just looking at the notes. And I mean, that's because these guys are total pussies, right? Bob Rodella can't handle anybody telling him no because it's this whole like he just believes he's better than anybody else in the universe. So he's like, well, how could you possibly reject him? And then the idea of just being it being easy once he's fucking out. Besides carefully noting what drug he injected into Howell and how much each dose was, Berdella also noted every time he sodomized Jerry, as well as the position that he did it in, noting FF for front fuck or BF for butt fuck. Oh. But... <laughs> I mean... Oh. Oh. It, I, oh. I don't know how to react. It is weird. It yeah. is weird. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to oh, say huh? that. Yeah, a lot of I times use, I use BF for best friend. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> BFF if we're gonna be friends for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. All right, <laughs> got another good work here at the at the precinct in Kansas City. <laughs> wow. But the weirdest was CF. Okay, hold on a second. CF. CF. We got front fuck. We got butt fuck. Uh huh. Th- Ch- choke fuck. No. Oh, that's Ugh. actually that's actually a very good guess. Carrot fuck. Yeah. <clears throat> what was that? <laughs> Carrot yeah. fuck. It's exactly what it sounds like. He w- Bob. He brought vegetables into this. Speaking of Seinfeld, that's like what uh, when when Costanza tries to eat the sandwich in bed. He's it's bringing just food like in it. bed. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, just it's like just it. like that fucking episode of Seinfeld. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I'm just trying to <laughs> fill just like the it. airwaves. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he sodomized each and every one of his victims with vegetables, either carrots or cucumbers, for reasons uh, known only to him. And the only way we would know if it's a carrot or a cucumber is that he took pictures, Polaroids, every single time he did it. This is a rare first. We've been doing this show for almost 10 years. Yeah. And then we have never heard of this before. This is a first. Wow, this is... So this is... Uh, He's a strange guy. Yeah, a strange guy. I'm yeah, that's a strange man. guy. Yeah, yeah. No, strange guy. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just a- odd duck. I yeah. am just trying to absorb it. <laughs> I just didn't know we were going to be talking about cucumber fox, <laughs> carrot fox. But concerning the situation with Jerry that Bob found himself in, he said this. I think from the point that I tied him up on, I, I, I was viewing the situation as irreversible. What was I to do? Untie him, let him get up, uh, either let him go willingly or have him escape. And at this point, I guess I just figured that I had burned my bridges and this is what was going on. And I stayed involved with the situation. Well, Jerry Howell endured 28 hours of torture Damn. at the hands of Bob Berdella before he finally died, either from an overdose from all the medication or from asphyxiating because the gag in his mouth blocked the vomit coming up from his throat. Oof. But according to Berdella, none of this was torture. According, Why not? According to him, the real torture wouldn't start until victims three or four. Oh. <sighs> But no matter what he called his actions in the lead up to Jerry's death, Berdella now had to get rid of a body. Mm. So he dragged the body down to the basement, hung it upside down from a beam, and took a few Polaroids before getting to work. First, he situated a large cooking pot under Howell's head and began draining blood from the body through incisions on the jugular vein. He then left the body draining while he went to work that Saturday. Saturday's big flea market day. Can't big miss day. that. Oh, yeah. These yeah. human skulls aren't going to sell themselves, so I better get over there immediately. <laughs> that evening, he came back home, put on his cook's apron, and went down to the basement to finish the job. To cut through the joints, he used butcher knives. But when it came time to cut through the spine, Berdella used a chainsaw to remove the head. He's like American Fatso instead of American Psycho. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Um, <laughs> yeah. Where are the roommates? Where are, are they just there just being like, oh, Bob's in the basement chainsaw on a Christmas tree again. <laughs> They're doing the powerful roommate 
horse blinders. <laughs> like the power of a roommate's horse blinders cannot ever be insurmounted. You never count out a roommate to completely ignore what's happening upstairs because you don't want to know. Oh. Phil is God knows what Phil's trying to do. He's got his synthesizer band, um, <laughs> Gary Juman. It's all fun. It's like a full Hanukkah themed synthesizer <laughs> band that he's working on. He's got three or four other gigs going. Like he's just trying to kind of make it go, and he hears him going, "Oh, this is just." You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to remove a human head. <laughs> I just, I mean, I'm sorry about the noise. Him coming in with a fucking chainsaw covered in blood, just being like, do you remember the guy I brought up here? He was kind of funny, right? <laughs> like he's try trying to be like, do you think he liked me? And Phil is just staring at Mario Kart. <laughs> just like playing Mario Kart. Just trying to get through Saturday. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, when Bob Berdella committed murders, no one was ever living with him. Okay. Uh, there was a, because people were, would usually only last like maybe a month or two before they were like, fuck this. I can't deal with this guy. Right. I can't deal with this house. I'm out of here. And a lot of the people coming in and out, they were drifters as well. Uh, they were usually either on drugs or bad alcoholics. And so they would move on. Okay. Uh, or Bob would kick him out just for not for being lazy and not paying rent. Or he'd fucking kill him. Sometimes they were the roommate. Ooh. Now, once Bob was done, he wrapped the body parts in newspaper, stuffed them in trash bags, stuffed those in empty dog food bags, and finally put all of it in the four big trash bags. He then left what used to be Jerry Howell on the sidewalk for the Monday morning garbage pickup. Did this is it's, it's garbage men are on the front lines of a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, they see a lot of things that we pretend yeah. to throw away. But yeah. Oh, no. This this is his M.O. Mm -hmm. We're going to find out that he used what we pay our good tax money for. Uh -huh. He used that garbage system to get rid of all of his victims. He just tossed them in the garbage and the garbage men just take it. And because if you do it, I guess, I mean, this is brutal to even say this out loud. But if you do it fast enough then they don't begin to smell yet. Right. Then they kind of just seems like it's big bags of meat, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, if you're throwing up bags of meat, I'd like to meet that millionaire because I try to keep as many, I keep meat for as long as possible. I use the meat. Yeah. Oh, you have God. a very poor man's vision of what wealth is. Um, but <laughs> I'm going to buy meat. I'm going to um, buy meat, and I'm just going to throw it away. I could throw away 100 pounds of meat this week. I'm doing pretty good. How much meat you throwing away? Oh, this is good-ass gray meat. <laughs> oh, my God. He might as well have just put the body in a in a cardboard box and wrote the, and wrote the word free on it. Yeah. Like, this is very dangerous. Yeah. What's, when, like, but I'm surprised he's so brave with the first murder to just be like, yeah, just put it on the curb. Yeah. I think he's ignorant oh. more than anything. And if you look at Luca Magnata, I watched the documentary series on Netflix last night. He did the same shit where it's, it's, it was first murder and he left the, he left the body in a very, very conspicuous place. And it's mostly, I think, out of just no, no practice. Okay. No clue what they're doing. But on the other hand, that wasn't what got him caught. No, he it did it no. six times and oh. it worked six fucking times. So. Who's the dummy now? Who's the dummy Whoa. now? <laughs> <laughs> it's always a great final sta statement before you're shot by the cops. Who's the dummy now? Who's the dummy now? Boosh, <laughs> boosh. Now, when the Howell family realized that Jerry had gone missing, they immediately suspected Bob Berdella. Because Jerry had been in and out of Bob's life. They'd been having fights. They'd been having tiffs. And Bob Berdella was a creepy fucking guy. He's but been trying to buy their friend yeah. for a month. But even though Paul Howell told cops that Bob Berdella murdered my son, cops did fucking nothing. Hmm. Like, nah, don't have enough evidence. So if you find some evidence, if you find something, then let us know. If not, eh, he'll show up eventually. Isn't that your job, officer? Aren't you supposed <laughs> to find the evidence? No, no, no. I oversee when <laughs> citizens do investigations. I oversee with it, and I, I have a gun. But I didn't go to school or anything to find evidence. I, I don't know forensics. You very... better get smart real quick. Oh, okay. All I got is a gun. <laughs> this you, Did you see that fucking in the Satanism thing with Geraldo, with the father of this young man? Yeah. When he, the, he does it in the most brutal way possible. He oh. just grabs the father by the shoulder. He's like, how does it feel? Your son was chopped up and left in the garbage. And the father is just going like, 
Not good. I don't feel <laughs> great. God, Geraldo. He's the fucking worst. And the, this, I mean, the whole thing, is, it's on YouTube in seven parts, I think, like seven, 15, 10, 15 minute Ugh. parts. It's worth watching. I mean, it is the trashiest fucking, it's trashier than the Bob Berdella documentary. But Geraldo yes. did break that scandal when it came to the, uh, when it came to the uh, facility. Out the Cropsy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Out in Staten Island. So that was, that was the one good thing. That, one that time. was one I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's one good thing. Now, at first, Bob Berdella said that he was sickened by what he'd done when it came Ugh. to Jerry Howell. And the pictures and the notes stayed hidden for months. But, but slowly, Bob started taking him out to sneak a peek. And hmm. before he knew it, he was masturbating to both the pictures and the notes. He made his own porn. Yeah. Wow. Yes. I mean, this is something that serial killers do. BTK made his own yep. pornography. Uh, he called it his uh, slick ads. That's right. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he would take uh, would lingerie ads yeah. and he would draw the ropes and all that shit over them, which is, it is, which is very strange because it's a way to even make like pornography involuntary. Whereas yeah. these women do not sign up to be bondage models, but BTK made them bondage models. What a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I am right on that, you know? Well, after an appropriate cooling off period, Bob Berdella killed again. On April 12, 1985, about nine months after the murder of Paul Howell, Berdella murdered a man named Robert Sheldon. Sheldon was a heavy drinker and had been in and out of Berdella's house for months by the time Bob had decided to kill him. The motivation, Bob said, was that he was annoyed. Honestly, the God damn it. His name is Sheldon. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, I know. I can't. Number one, I hate the fact that he has to tell me he's joking by saying Bazinga. <laughs> it infuriates me. Tis the season for holiday parties, which means tis the season for candid photos. Everybody wants to look their best, but some people might be worried about their thinning hair being the center of attention. If you've started to notice a bald spot popping up in your tagged photos, you're not alone. 66% of men start losing their hair by age 35. And once you've noticed thinning hair, it can be too late. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have some. Thanks to science, baldness can be optional. Hims is helping guys be the best version of themselves with licensed physicians and FDA approved products to help treat hair loss. This isn't snake oil pills or gas station counter supplements. These are prescription solutions backed by science. Hims was created by a guy who knows some men's health conversations are easier online than in person, which means no more awkward in-person doctor visits or long pharmacy lines. For Hims is completely confidential and discreet. All you got to do is answer a few quick questions, have a doctor review your file, and they determine the right treatment for you. And best of all, the medication is shipped directly to your door. This holiday season, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow with Hims. Try Hims today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash left. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash left. Forhims.com slash left. Prescription products are subject to a doctor approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. This could cost hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or pharmacy. Remember, that's forhims.com slash left. From your grave. One thing is certain in life expect the unexpected. And if you want to be prepared for the unexpected, Ethos can make sure your family is taken care of no matter what. Ethos is a faster, easier, and more affordable way to get life insurance to make sure your family is taken care of, even if you aren't around to take care of them. They're committed to finding the plan that's best for you and your budget, all from the comfort of your computer, tablet, or phone in just 10 minutes or less. Simply answer a few questions online about things like your health, age, and income, then finish your application and get a near instant approval. Everyone is different, but a healthy 35-year-old can get $1 million of coverage for only $50 a month. With Ethos, you can rest easy knowing the people you love are taken care of. Confusing terms and piles of paperwork not included. Our listeners can get started by going to ethos.com slash left and clicking on check my price. Again, get a fully personalized quote by going to ethoslife.com slash left. One more time, make sure to visit ethoslife.com slash left so they know we sent you. Right from your grave. So on April 12th, Berdella injected his victim multiple times while Sheldon was drunk, 
but the dude's tolerance was so high that all of this shit only made him a little stumbly. So this oh. was also like the morphine, the, a, all the, the other drugs and stuff. It wasn't morphine. I can't remember the name. Uh, like it was sometimes it was ketamine, mm. yeah. uh, oh, damn. Uh, or like various other like animal tranquilizers that ah. he just fucking happened to get a hold of. Well, Bob decided to wait. And two days later, gave Sheldon a pill that had the equivalent of five volumes in the capsule. Why are they selling these? He's getting them through uh, prescriptions. He's getting them through doctors. Uh, he's wow. getting them. He's getting all these volumes through doctors. And once Sheldon was unconscious, Berdella took off his pants, tied his legs together at the ankles, and carried him up to the third floor bedroom. Once there, Bob raped him and injected drain cleaner into Sheldon's left eye to permanently blind him, which made him easier to control. After that, Berdella took a hot needle and burned the word hot into Sheldon's back. But all he was doing there, he said, was putting his mark on the victim, and the word itself was not significant. After that, he gave Sheldon a soap and water enema and sodomized him with a carrot, taking Polaroids the whole time. What the fuck? He then decided to take even more control, using a caulking gun to fill up Sheldon's ears to render him completely deaf. Then, Bob went to sleep and left him there, tied up. Next still alive. Time, still, oh, very much still alive. Oh, oh yeah, my dude. God. No, this in, in a way... This, I mean, this is this is more of a pondering thing. Isn't it weird that it's almost vaguely childish? Yeah. That the experiments are very uh, like a like a kid would with a toy, mm -hmm. where he has this body and then he's kind of doing shit because it did seem to be he had like a plan. Like he came up with, I want to do this, 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 and this. These are things that I'm either extensively, I'm extensively fantasizing about, right? Where he's building the story in his own mind, almost like a it is an art project to him. Like he thinks, like we're gonna do all this stuff, but it's also weirdly like handling a dog, where he he wants to. I, I don't know where does like, where does the plan begin, and where is he just fucking riffing? I don't know if there was ever a plan. Not really. The mm. only plan that he had uh, was he always had penicillin on hand because all of this torture and shit that he was doing to him, uh, a lot of times infections would set in, they'd get fevers, so he would inject them with penicillin to keep them alive a little bit longer. Because for him, uh. the kill was not the point. Like the he liked the process. It was all about the process. The kill he couldn't give a shit about. This is disgusting, but did he eat the vegetables? Did he, like, eat the carrot? Was that, like, part you know of what? the know what? He didn't make that note. He didn't note it. Okay. <laughs> he didn't make that note. Okay. <laughs> well, the next morning, Berdella brought out a series of hypodermic needles and experimented with acupuncture to see which spots could produce the most pain. Then it was off to the flea market for a hard day's work. Got to move these skulls. Got to move the... There's so many Johnny Depp candles that need to be sold. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When he got home, he returned to the needles still protruding from Sheldon's skin because he didn't take them out. He left them in there all fucking day. Ugh. And he hooked the needles up to an electric transformer and shocked Sheldon again and again and again. And the whole time, Sheldon's hands were bound with piano wire so tightly that it probably would have caused permanent nerve damage, which would have rendered Sheldon's hands absolutely useless. Mm. Now Bob says the reason why he killed Sheldon was because he came home one day from the flea market to find the aforementioned Philip Bukovic up on the roof doing some work he was supposed to have done months earlier. Oh, but we're what? gonna fight about this now. We're gonna fight <laughs> on this now that I'm actually doing the work. It just feels like if you had a sense of urgency about the work, that we would not have been in this situation right now, where you're on the roof and I have a man tied up on my bed in the attic. What? What? What was that, Bob? It's a metaphor. <laughs> you know, it's a metaphor. It's about I have a lot of things, got a lot of irons in the fire. So get up there and finish the work. GD. <laughs> Phil, what do I got to say here? Wow. To, get, to motivate you. <laughs> well, Bob's logic was that Bukovic was probably going to be coming in and out of the house to use the bathroom while he was working on the roof. Sure. And it was only a matter of time before he accidentally either stumbled upon or heard Sheldon tied up in Bob's bed. So, with Bukovic up on the roof, Berdella went inside, tied a plastic bag over Sheldon's head, and suffocated him. 
like I said, the kills weren't important. It was just like, okay, now I got to get rid of this one. Right. And Bukovic hung around for another hour and a half, having no idea what was going on inside. This is scary. Yeah, I'm, that's, that's scary. You never know yeah, what's terrifying. going on. Yeah, it's terrifying. This is it's scary to have roommates. <laughs> yeah. After Bukovic left, Bardella dragged the body down to the third floor bathroom, used a boning knife to amputate the arms and legs, Ooh. and left the rest of the body in the bathtub to finish up the next day. Once daylight came, Bob used the chainsaw to remove Sheldon's head, which got stashed in the freezer. After a couple days. Bob removed it and buried it in his backyard. Hmm. He wanted the skull. That's what you do with uh, with if you have Ooh. speaking as a bone man. A uh, bone man. Oh, <laughs> yeah, bone, bone man. man. <laughs> if you have a he- the head of an animal and you want the skull, the best thing to do to remove all the flesh and all the and uh-huh. to get everything decomposed, you just bury it underground and you just leave it there. Do you think that this is something our audience needed to know? <laughs> do you really believe that anyone listening needs to know how to get a skull? Transform a head into a skull. Well, if you- Technically, it's the most constructive thing we've learned today. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I know guess it. So I'm, I'm, I'm like upset that I know it. <laughs> I didn't know that that that's what that is what you did to make sure it was super clean. I, I, I think that it's appropriate that it's the most goth way possible. Yeah. yeah. I, so all the well, all no, the bugs no, no. eat it. The most goth way possible is if you get the beetles. Uh, or the mm. ants, is that you get the head, you put it in a box with these like special ants or these special beetles that you can order online. You put oh. them in the box, and then the beetles and the ants will pick the head clean of all the flesh. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for those Dahmer ants. <laughs> They're like they like human skulls and human meat. Well, what do you do with the beetles then when they've got the taste for human flesh? You gotta burn those beetles, <laughs> you right? You gotta get rid of that box of beetles, oh, right? My. Absolutely. You can do whatever you want with the beetles. There's no laws against what you can do with the beetles. They're gonna but run then, rampant all over your gonna town. Run your house. <laughs> you got your beautiful wife sitting in the other room while you've got a you've got a fish tank filled with beetles. Absolutely jam packed with human flesh. Now we're ready for more. <laughs> no, it's a, when did it come into me having a human head that ha- did not have the flesh removed left? I'm not talking about humans. I'm talking about farm animals. I'm talking about you know dead bodies that you find on the ranch. Of I course, just... no, I understand. <laughs> of course, not. I remember that. <laughs> Definitely when I would just... not. It's never a thing called escalation. <laughs> no. I've never heard of that in our years of studying of studying serial killers. <laughs> well. Since it wasn't trash day just yet, going back to the Berdella story, since it wasn't trash day, Berdella stuffed the rest of the body parts into bags and stored them in the basement where it was a little cooler, mm. lest the smell of decomposition overtake the home. And then, once Monday morning came, because Monday morning's trash day, the body was set out on the curb and the garbage man took it away, completely oblivious to what was inside. From the sounds of it, decomposition might make the house smell better. No bet. To cover up all the dog shit. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Huh. That's an interesting question. Do I would I rather smell dog shit or rotting flesh? I didn't even ask that question. <laughs> what is going on? Dog shit is the answer, I have to say, in this weird scenario. It is definitely very controversial Harry Potter jelly bean flavors that they added this year that I was honestly very concerned about. <laughs> Now, as we've mentioned a few times, Bob took Polaroids at every stage of his process. From the sex to the electrodes to the vegetables to the post-mortem, Bob had records of everything. And when the cops finally raided Bob's house, they found over 300 Polaroids under his mattress. The problem the cops had, though, was that Berdella's face wasn't in any of the pictures. Oh, my God. But you know what? <laughs> what are the odds? Like, what? What? Oh, my God. Why are these Are these cops working for him? How are they going? Okay, whatever. Well, once Bob got captured, the cops were thorough. All they had in these pictures, they had an arm, they had a leg, sometimes a big belly, which left it wide open for the defense to say, you know what, maybe someone else took these pictures. Look under your bed right now. Do you have a bunch of Polaroids of a bunch of decomposing bodies? You're a serial killer. <laughs> I don't know, man. Sometimes they are. It's all makeup. If mm-hmm. you work in the FX community, a lot of times it's makeup. Yeah. But with Bob Berdella, they were really trying to pin him down. Because I, I, I read an article from 1988 in the New York Times that talked about the defense's whole thing of being like, anybody's penis or belly could have been in those pictures. My <laughs> client, yes, he is shaped like a pear with a silly mustache and funny glasses. But just because his very unique sensual body, I might add, doesn't mean 
that he is, in fact, well, actually, you know what? I'm looking at his belly right now. It's actually completely exactly the same. <laughs> there you go. So to cover all their bases, the Kansas City police stripped Berdella naked and made him recreate the positions in the photos so they could be sent to the FBI for matching analysis. Okay, which side do you want? Which side's my good side? You guys got proper lights to get my undercarriage? <laughs> What this a- is the area where my belly folds over my penis area. When you flip it open, you can see the weird dark creases underneath in the between. It's a rough day to be in the FBI, though. You just got a <laughs> box sent to your office be like, hey, Roy, you're on it this week. <laughs> All right. During this process, the cops would study each photo, then place Berdella's arm or leg in the same position and snap a comparison photo. But Okay, and they even it just took- seems like it, it seems like they're working hard, not smart. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that they're doing the last podcast way of place work, where you're just working way too hard. They even took pictures from his chest. They looking looking down at his big hairy belly. Yep, <laughs> you should see my phone is full of them. <laughs> there's so there's many like, that you could pick. There's just one copy. Like sometimes it's good to be an officer of the law. <laughs> He's <laughs> get over here, big boy. <laughs> But you know that Berdella was loving this shit. Yeah. Ugh. And one time, they made him sit naked on a stool with his legs spread apart to recreate the position he'd take during anal sex. Oh, yeah, man. This, okay, <laughs> seriously, like was it? J. Edgar Hoover still in charge of the FBI? Like, this just seems like they, they are using these photos for themselves. They had to match all the photos. They had to be thorough. This is right here, as I call my charbootery. <laughs> as you can see, you can see right here, I'm doing the full, yes, Gloria Gaynor. I am just all out there for everyone to see. Can you see how the shadows affect my balls? Oh, They're all just staring at it, just hard-eyed FBI guys. Yeah, show more of your asshole. Yeah. Turn- <laughs> yeah, oh, Lord, sounds like an American, uh, American. Oh my goodness, what was it? American Eagle? American Eagle? American Express photo shoot? American? American Apparel? Oh yes, American, American <laughs> Apparel <laughs> photo shoot. There we go. I don't shop there. They don't have any clothes, and their extra larges are smalls. So uh huh. I hate American. It's apparel. true. They are very small. It's oh, it's out of fucking business because the owner was a pedophile. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Big surprise. <laughs> Shocker. He makes children's clothes for adults. <laughs> Well, in another photo, they had Berdella grab a cop's gloved finger to simulate the angle of someone shoving an object into another person. Hey, uh, hey, watch this, Danny. When he grabs my finger, I'm going to fart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I shit. God. Oh, God. Some days it's great to be an officer of the law. <laughs> and these photos they found weren't just of Berdella's murder victims. One guy identified in the photos as Homer Roloff said he met Bob at the flea market and would sometimes do work in exchange for Valiums. Mm. Once, Berdella asked Roloff to climb a ladder to do a little work on the roof, but Roloff refused because he was afraid he'd fall and die. To this, Berdella said, quote, Well, I know how to get rid of the parts. <laughs> I'm a funny guy. Everybody loves me. I'm a life of a party. Yeah, you laugh. Laugh. <laughs> laugh. <laughs> and because everyone just laughed it off, Bob Berdella oh, yeah. murdered again just two months after he killed Robert Sheldon. Comedy was different in the 80s. <laughs> you think because John Wayne Gacy was the same way. They'd be like, lol, raffle. Yeah. This victim's name was Mark Wallace, and he'd previously helped Bob with some yard work. Now, Wallace was going through a hard time. He'd recently been dishonorably discharged from the Marines, and he developed a hard drinking problem. And when a thunderstorm came during a bad drunk in June of 1985, Wallace hid out in Berdella's tool shed. So when Berdella's dog started going nuts, Bob checked out the shed and found Wallace hiding inside. Did Berdella know this guy? Yeah. Oh, he did. So the guy was like, oh, I'm going to go hide out in Bob's place. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. so it wasn't just a random, like, no. coincidence. And, no. Because that would have been a message from God in the mind of Bob. <laughs> just be like, God wants me to kill again. They just show up now. No, he knew this guy. Sick. Okay. And after bringing him inside the house and talking to him for about an hour, Berdella injected Wallace with a tranquilizer at Wallace's request. Hmm. Berdella then kept him drugged. And eventually took him up to the upstairs bedroom, tied him up, and began the whole process anew. Ugh. This time, Bob connected alligator clips to electrodes and attached the clips to Wallace's genitals. So he just, what do you like? He liked to watch him shake? He, he liked to watch his... him in pain. Yep. 
He liked and to watch him scream. He liked to watch him pay. And also, it kept him awake. Reminds me a bit of the Grim Sleeper as well. Yeah. Because they, they, he loved the torture. Mm hmm. Mercifully, though, Wallace's ordeal was the shortest of all. Because Burdella had pumped so many drugs into his system so fast, Wallace, like Burdella's first victim, asphyxiated on his own vomit. But the problem was Sunday night. Ah. Trash collection's coming Monday morning. You got to get this done. Yep. So instead of taking his time like he had before, Berdella pulled an all-nighter and dismembered the body in time for the Monday morning pickup. And that's where we'll pick back up for part two of Bob Berdella. Oh, my. Honestly, wow. this guy, we have, I don't know what kind of weird netherworld you guys are living in right now, but these, <laughs> these past few killers that we've been talking about, you're right. This is like, this is a six man of the serial killer squad. <laughs> this guy. Uh, he is. Yeah, he's definitely, and you know what? And like Burdella pulling an all-nighter and dismembering the body in time for a Monday morning pickup, you too can grab last-minute Christmas gifts if you go into the last podcast. Are you going to plug com. our merch page like this? <laughs> this I is how you're going to plug our new merch page? I, th- I think it's important. It's 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 the holiday season. Um, get tickets for the last book tour on the left. We're going to 19 cities in 30 days. Yeah, that's great. Great, Henry. It's yeah, big we, for us. <laughs> it's a huge no, thing. We, we, are, we are so excited. Last book tour on the left. All, all throughout all of April. Yeah, all of April. We are super excited. We're going to be on the road. Tickets are on sale today. Go to lastpodcastontheleft.com to see all the dates. We're going to, let's see here. This is going to be from April 7th to about May 3rd. Are so you going to list all 19? Let me see if I can do it in one breath. Okay. All right. New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Durham, Atlanta, Chicago, Nashville, St. Louis, Houston, Austin, Dallas, Lubbock, Denver, Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. You did it. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> yeah we're going to Lubbock. I am so excited to be in the in the land that built Marcus Parks. <laughs> we're going to go digging. We're going to go, let's bury a cow skull. We can go bury cow skulls. Yeah, this is the hometown show. So, guys, I really fought for us to come to Lubbock on this tour, and, you know, because I, I want wanted to put my money where my mouth was all those years ago talking about how no one ever comes to Lubbock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wanted to come to Lubbock to, uh, you know, do a show so we could play for all the people that live in New Mexico and Oklahoma and all the small towns that are around Lubbock, Texas. So uh, come on out. Support. Please, please support that show. It's going to mean the world to me if you guys come out to that one. We are so excited to be there. Absolutely. And Marcus did physically fight both Henry and I (laughs) to get us to Lubbock, which is very exciting. I appreciate it. Uh, come out uh, this Saturday, uh, December 21st, to see Ed Larson and I at Classy Night Out in the Pack Theater. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. 9 p.m. It's free, but donations are accepted. We're going to have a lot of fun joking around. I'd like to give another special thank out and a shout out to French Quarter Phantoms. Yeah. They gave us a fucking huge hookup, and they were, I mean, honestly, one of the best ghost tours I've ever taken. I would say it was the best ghost tour I've ever been on. It was fantastic. It, like I if you're if you New Orleans, right. go to French Quarter Phantoms. They're the fucking best. And thanks to everyone who came out to our live performance, our live taping of this year's special in, of course, beautiful New Orleans. You guys could not have been sweeter and better, and we were just so thrilled to be uh, celebrating our last couple of shows with all y'all in New Orleans and. We all, I think all three of us fell in love. Beautiful place. Just a gorgeous bunch of people and great culture, great food, great drink. Loved it. Everyone was awesome. So much fun, man. Honestly, and I can't wait to go back. The audiences could not have been better and kinder and warmer. This is our last show before LPN is going to take a break for Christmas, uh, for the holidays. Yep. And so I just want to say, guys, fucking do your best to be good to humankind. Don't be like Bob Berdella. Let him go. I'm going to say right now, if you have a captive in your attic, uh huh, just for Christmas, let him go. Let him right? go. There you <laughs> go. Let him go. Just, just know that. Give a give one back. See, this is what just, I've been talking about. He's in the Christmas spirit. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Usually, he'd be like, keep him longer, drug him, drug him. <laughs> but now he's like, let them go. Isn't that nice, Henry? See, I'm You're, growing. You I'm really growing. are growing. Yeah. You really are. And so we will be off. The network will be dark the 21st through the 30th. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then all the shows that you love will be back in your life. Yeah, we'll be back uh, with uh, part two of Barbara Della on January 3rd. 
record. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much for a fantastic year. This has been uh, amazing. It's been ridiculous. We've been able to tour the entire fucking world. Oh we did, God. what, seven countries this year. We did 51 live shows over the course of 2019. This we is finished gonna- our book. 2020 is going to be fucking great. This is going to be one of the... S- rare years where New Year's I'm actually going to I'm going to try to remember everything that we did this year I was trying to unpack it I was talking to Burke yesterday I was like Australia the UK I mean this whole year was just so insane and uh and of course and it's uh, meant yes it's meant so much to us because we this year we went through the honestly the the highest highs and lowest lows that we've ever had uh, the, we lost KB this year. January twenty second. That's that was the kickoff of the year. That was the day that uh, that we found out Kevin had passed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, I just you guys have been there f- yep. for all of it. You guys have supported us, uh, and it's meant so much. And we can't wait to start twenty twenty hardcore with Bob Bradella part two. And again already ramping up we have so many fucking fun ass topics coming up like i am i think i'm more excited for 2020 in terms of topics than i've been not in a long time but it's like we have stuff that's like lined up that we've been kind of waiting on yeah and i'm really really excited to get down in the guts of it absolutely yeah. a lot of mind-blowing subjects for y'all coming in january or coming uh, in 2020 yeah we've got actually we've got every episode until mid-april planned out already for 2020 we're going to be doing some shit that people have been asking us to do for forever we're going to be do redoing some things that we tried in the early days but didn't quite pull off we're going to be doing them proper uh and also if you guys are coming out to one of our live shows for the book tour in April, remember that you can pre-order a signed copy of the book when you buy your ticket. Yep, so absolutely. If you'd love to do I mean, we're right now in the process of signing 16,000 pages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But we, uh, yeah, we, we'd love for you guys, when you come out to the show, we'd love for you to buy our book as well, to, uh, you know, to pre-order the book. Uh, that'd be fantastic. It'd be, That's it, it. It's going to mean the world for us for, for y'all to read this thing. Well, we wanted to get it on the New York Times bestseller list, and we're not doing it the fake way like all those other books that are sold. Like You name it. When it comes to when I worked over at Fox News, they would just get piles and piles and piles of books, mm-hmm. boxes and boxes, and then they'd be like, we bought in bulk, and then they can be on the New York Times bestseller list. That's how they cheat. That's how they scam the system. But as yeah. always, we're doing it the right way, the organic way, to the best of our abilities. Um, so please get this book because, honestly... Henry and I can attest Marcus Parks, he blew his, he damn near blew his brains out working on the stand thing. <laughs> yes, so, and um, I want you to support his fucking ass, and also, because it counts when you get the book, the pre-order this way. Yes, We yeah. have some people that pre-ordered back in the day when they first kind of came out, we want to thank you for your support, but they don't, it doesn't count. Now it technically counts, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. So if you can, fucking hit it. That would be incredible. Absolutely. We, uh, we also want to thank, and you'll see this in the book, Amazing artist Tom Neely. Tom Neely Such fucking killed so it. So good, incredible so art. Good. You guys are gonna love this book. We're so proud of it, and it's been a labor yeah. of love and um, awesome. All right, y'all. We'll have oh, a one, one more, one more little shout out. If you're looking for, and I just say this as a fucking a, a help for you. If you're looking for a fun watch this Christmas, and you're just looking for something to maybe either upset the family or something your family will love, check out Joe Bob Briggs Christmas special on Shutter. He just did Silent Night, Deadly Night two. Oh, and sweet. it is. So worth it. It is one of the best bad good movies I've seen in a long time. It's been so long since I've seen it, and it is so worth it. If we just fucking laughed our asses off while we were watching it last night. Joe so, Bob Briggs. If you want to listen to the interview we did with Joe Bob, you can uh, give to our Patreon, and then uh, that interview was there along with many, many other interviews. Um, all right, everyone. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks for supporting us this year. Have a wonderful holiday, whatever you're celebrating. Try to get along with people as much as you can. And if you're in a fight, you know what you do? Just get up there and leave. Just get, leave the room. Leave the room. Go get some leave. seafood somewhere or something. It's not worth it. Okay, everyone. Hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Ma- Again. Magustalations. And meow. Meow, meow. Meow, meow. I'm wearing soft pants today. You are. What does that mean? Soft pants. They're sweatpants. Athleisure. <laughs> <laughs> this show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.